Oh, hi. I didn't see you standing there. Why, yes, there's plenty of seats around the fire pit. Please join in, join in. While the others make their so comfortable or whatnot, go ahead and settle down and relax a bit. While we're all sitting here around this beautiful, warm fire, I've got some spooky tales to tell you. But before I do, let me announce. Welcome to Back to Ashes, everyone. If you're new here and you enjoy what you were hearing, please think about hitting that subscribe button. Make sure to ding the bell and set it to all. That way you'll be reminded of every time I upload a video. Also, if you're looking to become a member or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, that can be found down below. Now, without further ado, and it's time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Creepy Encounters. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Oh, and I almost forgot one thing. Have a listen to this. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. That's what AI sounds like, so... This will be the last time that I actually talk about it. I don't use AI. This is actually my voice. Anyone else who continues to stay in the comments and put negativity and do all kinds of stuff, you'll meet my best friends. Deleted and blocked. Want to get back to the stories? Let's do that. This happened to me about 10 years ago. I was 18 years old and working in a very popular chain restaurant at my local mall. It was one famous for breakfasts, and the uniform was a brightly colored button-down shirt that was easily recognizable. It was a Sunday, our busiest day of the week, and a holiday on top of that, so we were crowded and crazy busy. When it came time for lunch break, I didn't want to bother the kitchen with my order, so I decided to quickly pop out to a different restaurant to eat and return to help my coworkers again. It was very crowded and slow going. After a bit of walking, a tall older man casually fell into step next to me. At first, I didn't pay him any mind due to the crowd, but then he started talking to me directly and was difficult to ignore. Hey there, what's your name? Where do you work? Unfortunately, I still had my name tag on and it showed both the restaurant and my name, so I said nothing in response. Oh, I should stop by for some pancakes and waffles sometime. No response, no eye contact either. Any other question he asked me was answered with silence or one word answers. I was afraid to be impolite, but also really didn't want to give him any leeway. Finally, he asked, how old are you? I'm 15. I was absolutely of age, but I hoped that lie would put him off. He was definitely in his thirties. Then. Hey, I can work with that. And he touched my shoulder. I don't know what kind of reaction he wanted from me, but I instantly recoiled, eyes wide. I ducked into the closest store, probably GameStop, I think it was, and started browsing like my life depended on it. Fortunately, he did not follow me into GameStop, nor did he follow me when I finally left to go grab my lunch. I didn't see him again, and if he ever did stop by the restaurant for his pancakes and waffles, I never had the misfortune of serving him, thank God. It still stuns me to this day that I barely reciprocated and then told him I was underage, and none of that made him stop trying to interact with me. Just, wow. That also isn't the only time I was followed around the mall by a strange man, but it was the worst one, in my opinion.
When I was about 11 to 14 years of age, I had a best friend named Spencer. Spencer had a decent sized family and a big house. We hung out practically nonstop outside of school. He was homeschooled and I was in public school. During the summer, I practically lived at their house. Spencer had an older brother named Keenan. Keenan was about five years older than him and I, and I thought he hung the moon. He was so cool. He listened to great music and played guitar, and I always wanted to be around him. One summer when I was 13, Keenan went to summer camp. He was supposed to visit the Grand Canyon and go kayaking and do all types of fun stuff. We were seriously jealous. It was weird not having him around all the time since I basically stayed at their house the entire time. Finally, the day came where Spencer's dad was supposed to go to the airport to pick him up. We were super stoked to hear all about camp. His dad drove up and we ran downstairs to greet him. And yet, we didn't see Keenan. His dad had tears running down his face and exclaimed, He didn't make it. He didn't make it, you guys. My heart dropped to my stomach and I started to panic. Keenan walked right up behind us and they both started laughing. It was a huge dick move. Anyways, we helped him unload his luggage and stayed up all night until midnight talking about his summer. He had so much to say. He said he had the time of his life and told us all about how he almost went overboard, white water rafting, and how he surely would have drowned if he had done so. As two 13-year-old boys, we were enamored by Keenan and everything he did. We talked about how Spencer and I were going to go to the same camp once we turned 18. It had been a long day and it was time for all of us to go to bed. Keenan told us he would tell us more in the morning when we woke up. I had fallen asleep and awoken in a cold sweat because of a nightmare I had. In my dream, Spencer and I went about our entire day that day, just as we had before, except when their dad showed up and joked about Keenan dying on his trip. He actually did die. This was particularly my idol and the dream was so vivid. I needed to go and get some water just to calm myself down afterwards. I checked my phone before I headed to the kitchen. It was 3.30 a.m. The house was so dark and I had to tiptoe to be quiet and make sure not to wake anyone up. As I walk through the den on the way to the kitchen, I see the moonlight spilling into the living room, the only light in the house. I see what I think is a large silhouette, and as I get closer and my eyes adjust, I see Keenan hanging from the ceiling fan. I freaked out and run across the room in a dead sprint and turn the light on to see if my eyes were deceiving me. It was him, except he was asleep and standing in the middle of the room underneath the fan, with one of his arms raised straight up over his head. I never knew Keenan to sleepwalk before, and luckily he snapped out of it before I tried to wake him up. He looked at me super confused, looked around and noticed where he was and said, Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you guys, I guess I developed a bit of a sleepwalking habit at camp. It was August of 1992, and I had just moved away to Sydney, Australia, from my home in New York City. My grandfather had recently passed after a prolonged cancer battle. He was my favorite grandparent, and almost 30 years later, I still miss his warmth and stories. I still dream about him to this day, and in my dreams, I tell him how much I miss him. During this period while he was dying, my parents had been making plans to move our family from a home in New York to Sydney, Australia. 
as my dad is Australian and had been offered a job during a previous visit to his side of the family. The combined passing of my grandfather and the sudden uprooting of my comfortable and familiar life to live halfway across the world had left me feeling insecure and alone. Forced to adjust to a life in a different cultural environment away from all of my childhood friends and old school was different for a 10-year-old. To help alleviate these feelings of homesickness, my parents got me a puppy, a chocolate Labrador named Milo. He was only six weeks old when we got him, and like all puppies, he was a handful. My mom would get angry at me as he would constantly howl during the night and would rip out the stuffing of our sofas. We would wake up to tufts of couch foam scattered all over our living room. My mother was a manic depressive and losing her father, my grandfather, had only compounded her grief and rage at the world. She threatened to send the puppy to the pound or give him away to one of her friends. When my mother would lose it, I would take Milo out for a walk near our home. We wouldn't venture too far, just a few blocks to this park I knew where I could be alone with my thoughts. The park is hard to describe. It was a public park with a swing set and some walking trails, but it had the appearance of a semi-cleared forest, like a lot of unkept shrubs, old trees with spindly branches that would reach out in all directions, and wild grass you could get lost in. It was not huge, but not exactly small either, and for a kid, it was an easy place to lose yourself in with all the dark corners of the backwoods. The name is Harborview Park, if you wish to Google it. This park had two entrances, a steep stone staircase that led to a sidewalk above and another staircase that led to a sidewalk below. I was walking Milo on the sidewalk above this park when suddenly a car pulled up in front of me. I think the car was white and I don't remember the mate now, but it was some kind of sedan. An overweight middle-aged man with a huge walrus mustache and sunglasses got out of the driver's side door in front of me and looked straight at me. I froze. I still remember him saying, I'm not gonna hurt you. And that triggered some primal panic within me. My parents had always told me to be wary of strangers, and even at 10 o'clock, I was fully aware that children were abducted and even killed. I grabbed Milo up into my arm and we bolted down the stone stairs, descending into the deep bowels of the canopied park below. My heart was beating so loud I could feel its reverberations in my throat. I darted behind some shrubbery near a broken tree trunk. I was holding Milo so tight against me that I was worried I might crush him. Through the branches, I could make out the street above-ish and see the white sedan was idling above, but the man did not follow me. I hid there in that sharp shrubbery, almost completely still for what seemed like half an hour. The car above never moved, but no one came into the park either. Eventually, I ran through the long grasses and rough detritus of this half park half forest floor. Sunlight poured in from the other end of the park, like a light at the end of the tunnel. There were stairs at this southern end, just like there were above. I walked down the street, nervously glancing around for a white sedan. It was a twilight now, and the sun was setting beneath the red brick houses that made up my neighborhood. I resolved to make it back to my home and ran the five minutes back, never telling my parents what I thought had almost happened to me. About two days later, I heard on the news about an abduction. A girl disappeared while getting off her bus a few suburbs away from me. There were abductions all the time, and of course, there was no proof that it was any way related to my own experience. 
There's also no proof that the walrus mustache man in the white sedan was even out to abduct me. It's possible he was just going to ask for directions and saw I was nervous. However, I don't believe a normal grown man would stop a 10 year old boy for directions or anything else of an innocent nature. Was he out to abduct me? I'll never know for sure, but I think I made the right choice in running. For a long time, I was scared to death to walk my dog near my home and would get a lump in my throat whenever I saw a similar car slow down near my side. I eventually moved on, but I'll never forget that feeling of sheer panic I left as I rushed down into the park that day. My female friend came to visit me for a long weekend, and I won't be letting her stay ever again. Here's a little backstory. We were friends for three months before we both moved to separate states and continued our friendship virtually until now. It has been a healthy relationship with open communication. We have had our disagreements, but mostly always talked it out and moved on. They mostly revolve around her being, I don't open up enough, and for me, she does things that are inconsiderate at times, like be jealous of my long-term friends. To their faces, mind you, and an odd attitude problem at times only has been shown maybe three times. She can also be a bit obsessive and get upset when I don't text her for more than a day. She's got loads of my photos saved to her phone and remembers every little thing about me and has a list of my interests. I've seen it endearing until now. The trip. Day one. The first day of the trip was great. She was bubbly and brought me a gift with a sweet note of appreciation. We went clubbing and headed to bed, separately, for the night. This is where things got weird. Remember, we slept separately. Well, I woke up and she was in my bed, but not in my bed. She was sitting upright on top of the blankets next to me, with her feet straight out and her back against my headboard while looking forward. I was started and said, Ugh! instinctively. She just looked at me. She never said she was waiting for me to wake up or maybe she was uncomfortable on the couch. Nothing. Then she left my room. I have no clue how long she was sitting there. Day two and three. Day two, in the morning, we walked the city where she was engaged and wanting to hold my hand while we were out and about. By midday, still day two, her attitude had shifted completely and she is near mute. She isn't conversing with me, enjoying any activities or even smiling anymore at the bar, arcade, or even at home watching movies. You know how those driving games take a silly little photo of your profile pic on the leaderboard? I was blown a kissy face in mine. I glanced at hers and even snapped a pic without her noticing. Her head was tilted forward looking up at the camera. She was blank faced and you can almost see the whites of her eyes. It was like the film poster of a horror movie. See the Orphan 2009 version. Anyways, for the rest of the trip, she continued to not smile. She was cold to every service worker. She responded with one word answers, otherwise complained about any and everything. I asked, hey, are you okay? A couple of times and she replied, I'm fine, avoiding eye contact every time. Car rides were silent, dinners were silent. Day four. Final day, I drove her to the airport at 3 a.m. I asked if she enjoyed her visit and she said, it was okay, it was fine. I told her I enjoyed having her. She boarded her flight and left. I cannot figure out what caused this 180 degree shift. 
I paid for everything, took her to all sorts of events she wanted to go to, and even took a day off, my first sick day, ever, to take her to more. I felt myself overcompensating because I felt insecure of being a terrible host or something. I've had several friends stay with me and express to me that they enjoyed themselves so much they never wanted to leave. I don't believe I did anything so wrong to ruin this trip. When she arrived home, she did not contact me, but she posted photos and videos of me, captioned, MINE, on her social media. I haven't brought this conversation to her yet. All of my friends and family believe I nearly missed a Selena Yolanda slash Lifetime film situation and that I was potentially with someone unstable. I don't know. What do you think? I was 19 at the time, which was around 2009. Had a weekday off work. I decided to go to the beach by myself and brought my guitar along. This was rural North California where the beaches are below cliff faces and usually empty of other people. This was a particular beach where someone had built a driftwood hut into the side of a steep cliff with the beach below about 100 feet. You can just barely see the roof of the structure from the highway. I had always wanted to check it out, so I parked my car on the highway and made my way along a narrow trail to the hut. It was a beautiful day, so I sat up near one of the hut windows and was playing my guitar and watching the waves. Suddenly, I hear someone else walking down the trail. I'm a little nervous, but figure it must be well known to locals or something. Then enters the man. Immediately, I got major creepy vibes from him. He was in his late fifties, overweight, unshaven, thick glasses, sloppy dirty clothes, sweatpants and a dirty white shirt, but not homeless or anything. He immediately initiates conversation with me. First, just nice pleasantries, talking about the view, the weather, then he starts asking personal questions. Do you live around here? Do you go to college? Are you working today? Are you here with anyone? I answer very vaguely and am starting to get uncomfortable and feel trapped. The hut is very long and narrow and there's no way for me to get to the trail leading back to the car without passing him. At this point, I only say the bare minimum, trying to show him I'm not interested in conversation. I look away and he snaps a picture of me on his disposable camera. I ask him what he was doing and he says he wants to show his friends back home how beautiful the girls in California are. At this point, I start brainstorming my opinions. I can uh, try to run past him, but I will have to get close. I can jump out the windows of the hut towards the ocean, but it's a pretty steep cliff face to the beach, 100 feet down or more below. My gut started telling me this was a dangerous situation, but I was frozen. I did not know what to do. Then he tells me that he needs to go to his truck to get something, something about his camera but I knew he had already used his camera. He leaves the hut, but there's still no way for me to go to my car without passing him. I'm brainstorming on what to do, but I kept thinking maybe I'm overreacting. I run to the entrance of the hut, but he's already making his way back down the trail toward me. This is the gross part. He has a very large and visible erection in his sweatpants, and he has something under his arm. I run to the opposite side of the hut, jump out of the window, 
sitting on the ledge of the steep cliff. In that split second where I had to make a decision, I look in the sky and see two hawks fighting each other. I had just read The Alchemist, and if you remember, the universe sends the main characters omens and signs. One particular omen in the book is two fighting raptors, which ended up meaning something bad was coming and to run. In that moment, I knew I had to scale that steep cliff to the beach below. I decided I'd rather die falling or die swimming across the river. The beach below was also the estuary to a large river. Then find out what the creep was planning. So I started scaling the steep cliff. He ran to the edge and asked where I was going. He yelled for me to come back. Adrenaline kicked in so hard, I made it down surprisingly fast without falling or getting hurt. Luckily, he didn't follow. He stood there the entire time yelling for me to come back. I was shaking. I made it to the beach and hid in some vegetation for what felt like forever, but was probably only 20 minutes. I finally decided it was safe to walk down the beach to where the actual trail is. I could see a man standing at the top. It wasn't him. I could tell by the silhouette, but I was terrified he had an accomplice. I decided to risk it and run up and ask for help. It ended up being a park ranger. I told him the whole story. He walked to the hut and the creep was gone. He put out a radio call so enforcement would be on the watch and I filed a police report. When I left abruptly, I left my purse and all of my stuff in the hut. It was all still down there when I returned with the ranger before I was terrified that he went through my belongings and saw my address on my ID. For months afterward, I was scared to be alone at home. I think the creep would have done something awful if I had stayed in the hut that day. I think he might have gone to his truck for a weapon or rope or something, but I'm not sure since I couldn't see what he was tucking under his arm. At 19, I didn't know to trust my gut. Now I know not to worry about what anyone thinks if I feel danger and the need to bolt. I'm not religious or anything, but I thank the universe for sending me a very clear sign at such a pivotal moment. Nothing ever came of the report, but sometimes I search for that town name and crimes in case I ever recognize his mugshot. Hello everyone. This happened when my best friend was 17 and a half and I was 17 in 1996. My best friend, Chrissy, and I are both smaller females. She is 5'4 and at the time weighed 110 pounds, but was a soccer player, very athletic and strong. I am 5'7 and at the time I weighed 125 pounds. We are both blue-eyed blondes and were often asked if we were sisters or cousins. There is a large reservoir on the outskirts of her town, surrounded by a beautiful public park. We figured we'd be fine to walk around in the park because lots of people go hiking there. I had gotten some really good quality weed and we were looking forward to finding a peaceful place to smoke some out in nature. I had my pipe ready in my pocket and we were stoked. We chose to go out on a Saturday. It was a beautiful sunny day and there were not many people there. We parked our car by the reservoir in the mostly vacant lot that had two other cars. We did not see anybody when we got there. We walked around the water for a bit and then chose the trail to go up. It was about 80 degrees outside and we were sweating, but we had some water in my small day pack. As we got about a quarter mile or so into the trail, I started having a weird feeling. 
I looked at her and quietly asked, Hey, do you feel something is off here? Everything is really quiet. Where there was usually crickets chirping and frogs singing, it was totally silent. She looked at me and said, Yeah, I think so. And then we heard some crackling of leaves about 60 feet behind us and a bit to the left. We did not see anybody at that time, so we continued forward. We were both getting pretty nervous, and we heard the crackling again this time, a little bit closer. We still did not see anyone. Each time we would continue forward, we would hear footsteps a little bit more behind us. I thought we were being stalked. There was a turnoff to the left, which led to a clearing by a large rock about 12 feet high, with a large, sturdy rope anchored on it to climb up to the top. It was part of a steep hillside cliff. The rope to climb it was anchored to the ground, as well as one could not move it. I told her, We need to get up that rock now. We need higher ground. She nodded and went up first with me, right behind her. We flew up that rock, clinging to the rope tightly, going as fast as we could. When we reached the top, we turned around to see an older man, probably about 45, with a slider build, wearing a jacket, jeans, and glasses coming into the clearing. He was about 20 feet away. He looked at us with a cold, vacant expression. I got goosebumps just looking at him. I shouted, Hi, will you please leave us alone? We're trying to have some privacy here. He made no response, and with a blank expression, slowly started walking toward the rope, which led to the top of this rock. My friend at this point was really scared and asked, What do we do? I saw a large rock about eight feet and almost square to my right, so I grabbed it. I was surprised at how heavy it was, but my adrenaline was going, so I lifted it easily. I told her, Look around for the biggest rocks you can find, fast. Move them next to us. Hold the biggest one. If that guy tries to come up, we throw them at him and hit him as hard as we can. Aim for his head. Fortunately, There was a pile of sizable rocks behind us to the left, like someone had made a ring to hold a fire on top of the rock and then move them away. She brought a few over and held a large one herself. My friend and I stood close to the edge of the rock, holding our makeshift weapons. I looked down the edge of the rock where the guy was considering the rope. He looked up at us again with very cold blue eyes and no expression. Then he reached his hand for the rope. I shouted loudly, Do not come up here. If you try to come up here, you're going to get really hurt. We are aiming for your head with these rocks. Get the fuck away from us. I held the rock close to my chest so he could see it. My friend was next to me doing the same thing. We had a pile of more rocks. He blinked his eyes and cocked his head a little bit, then released his hand from the rope and silently backed away. He backed to the edge of the clearing, backed through the brush, still watching us, and then we heard his crunching footsteps go back through the woods until we couldn't hear him anymore. We stayed on that rock for another 20 minutes, maybe a bit more, watching and waiting. There was no other way to access the road except for the steep hillside covered with poison oak, so we did not think he'd try it. And plus, we'd be able to hear him if he did. After we didn't hear anything for 20 minutes, we decided to make a break for her car. We threw several rocks down the ground. Mine hit the dirt with a particularly satisfying thud. Chrissy went first down while I was keeping watch in case he came back. When I was scaling down the rock, she was holding a rock ready to throw it full force if he had returned. Fortunately, he did not. 
We each grabbed the largest rock we could carry, put a few smaller ones in our pockets for a good measure, then headed back to the car on the trail, very carefully and quietly. The crickets were chirping again, so we felt like he had left, but we were still extremely cautious. We did make it back to the car without incident and quickly left. That was the last time I had ever hiked in that park. Hello everyone. I hope you were all doing well. This was a situation a couple weeks back that left a bad taste in my mouth, per se. Here's a bit of context. It might be a bit long, but hopefully it will give you some background to what made this encounter so creepy for me. This encounter happened about three weeks ago or so, right around the time lockdown was in its prime here in Australia. I'm a 23 year old living near Byron Bay, about a 20 minute drive away in the surrounding hinterlands. I was born and raised in the city though, so I like to think my judgment of character is a bit finer developed than country folk. For those not familiar, Byron is a major tourist attraction in northern North South Wales, really close to the Queensland border. It's a beachside town known for its laid-back lifestyle. Because of this, we get a lot of passerby, even a little bit further out because of the nice views and rich bushland, etc. And it's not usual to meet a few odd people here and there. There's also your dose of strange activity, i.e. backpacker Theo Hayes' disappearance not long ago. If you're interested in learning about that case, The Lighthouse has a great podcast about it. Lots of people up here have theories on this ranging from cult to just straight up cold-blooded murder. In my suburb, it's still quite rural on our street. There's about five houses total, covering a good couple of hundred acres. And at the end of the street, there's a path through the brush to a lovely waterfall. The journey of my property to the beginning of the track is about five minutes, and the path leads to two destinations. The first destination is about five minutes into the track at the top of the waterfall. It has a little wooden platform you can stand on to look out over the waterfall and the streaming leading into it. The second is about another five minutes down the track, which is the waterfall itself. Most people keep to the left of the waterfall and will sit under it in the cave, as the almost non-existent clearing to the right of it, it's quite inconvenient and tricky to get to if you aren't planning on getting really wet. This is important for later. I used to go down there quite often to write in my journal and clear my head, and my favorite place is just next to the top of the waterfall. I'll climb through the fence next to the wooden platform and sit next to the stream on a rocky face that covers either side of the stream. The view was the nicest here, and I also liked to sit facing the wooden platform so I could keep better tabs on my environment. This particular day, I went down and coming up the track, I noticed a camper van parked with lots of tools and rope attached to the roof. I couldn't see anyone in there, but just had a bit of an inkling there was. So I gave the car a pretty wide berth, social distancing, but also very ever-present paranoia thanks to this and other true crime subs. And as I passed it, I noticed the side door was opened, which quickly slid shut. Straight up, I thought it was pretty fucking weird. It's illegal to set up camp there, and also, we were in a period of essential travel only, so I wasn't really expecting to see anyone down there except for a neighbor going for a stroll. However, I passed it off as a tradie wanting to get out of the house into nature for a bit after work or something and kept on. 
I went to my usual writing place. But, as we had had a bout of pretty heavy rain days prior, the stream was full and I wasn't up to crossing it. So, I sat on the same side as the wooden platform, about 10 to 15 meters away. I wasn't there for long, maybe five minutes of writing with my headphones in, when I heard something. It sounded like a bird over my music, so I just went back to what I was doing. But then, a few seconds later, I saw someone out of the corner of my eye coming onto the platform. I ignored them and tried to go back to what I was doing, partly because I was in a pretty foul mood and wanted to be left alone, but also because it's not really common for anyone to talk to each other out in the bush, apart from the occasional, how are you going, passing someone on the track, so I thought maybe they were on the phone. Nope. He yelled out to me again, which I ignored, and then again. I got the feeling he wasn't going to let up, so I fiend surprised along the lines of, Oh, sorry, I didn't see you and couldn't hear over my music. <laughs> he was in his late 30s, early 40s, just a pretty normal looking dude. The rest of the conversation is hard to recall verbatim, but essentially it went like this. Are you going to or can you jump off? The waterfall? I can't remember which one he said. Uh, no. Well, why not? Because I don't know how deep that water is. Good answer. It seemed pretty harmless, and I assumed he was just visiting the falls for the first time, so I tried to cut off the conversation by going back to my writing. He didn't let up, however. And this is where it started to get a bit weird. I was already feeling quite unsettled by his presence, as he wasn't very focused on the surroundings, and more on me. Which was pretty strange, considering the entire world is in a state of encouraging no communication at the moment. What are you, one of those nature people who likes to come out here all by herself? Uh, no. What are you doing out here, then? Trying to clear my head and write. It's nice and quiet out here. Am I bothering you? Uh, yeah, but it's whatever. Honorable mention to my ADHD for making me always susceptible to saying the wrong thing and pretty much incapable of lying. There was a bit of a lull here. Both of us just kind of sizing each other up, I guess. Me just really wanting him to fuck off, but also not being too worried if he did try anything, as I had a large stick with me. Was still pretty warm out, so I always carry it with me because of the snakes. How did you get here? I just climbed down off the path through the fence? No. How did you get here? Here, to this place. Uh, I walked. Pretty long walk to be out by yourself. Not really, just up the road. Something about the response changed something in his behavior. But, as we were pretty far apart, it was a little bit hard to figure out what. Regardless, I wasn't vibing the situation at all, and was also kicking myself for making it glaringly obvious to some random dude I was out here alone, and for not having told my family where I was going. Huh. Well, I guess I'll leave you to your writing. This calmed me down, and once again, just passed him off as a passerby. The views are a lot nicer under the waterfall, if you follow the path down. Oh, <laughs> I don't know if I could go alone. There could be some people down there waiting to mug me. You'd have to come with me. Like, what? Who says shit like this? Especially to someone you just met in the middle of nowhere. No, probably just someone having a picnic or a swim. 
He stood there for a bit longer than I would have liked looking at me, and then finally left me alone with an, All right, I'll see you later. As we head back up the path forward to the parking lot, and I assumed he was going home. I still felt a bit uneasy, so I turned off my music completely and tried to go back to my writing. Some time passed, but I was struggling to concentrate, which is not unusual. But it wasn't my usual restlessness. I just felt so uncomfortable, almost like being exposed. So I took a break just to enjoy the scenery, and I looked down at the bottom of the waterfall. And this guy is standing to the right of it. Really inconvenient to get to and also the only place from down there where you could see me. And that's exactly what he was doing. Just standing there, staring at me. I thought I was just wigging out, but nope. I could literally feel his eyes on me. I nope the fuck out of there. Even if he was just a creepy dude with innocent enough intentions, I wasn't going to wait around to find out, and I'd have a five minute head start if he did try to follow me. So I ran back home, and what was left of my journal entry for that day was essentially just about that weird ass guy. I waited to hear his car go by as well, but it didn't only one road, so I would have heard him leaving, which I thought was weird. So I assumed he must have set up camp there or whatever, or just left later that night. I don't know. Either way, it sufficiently creeped me out and ruined that spot for me. I haven't been back since then. In my hometown, there's a huge lake. This place is big and desolate, idea for camping, fishing, and hunting. I lived in Norway, and we have something called every man's right, which is basically saying that you can roam free wherever you want in the country, as long as it's not on private property. For this reason, Norwegians like to walk around in nature, and where there is more than enough room for everyone. People usually don't accumulate. My friend and I were planning a camping trip. We were going to head up the river by boat and go to an island in the middle of the lake. When we got there, we found an ideal spot. The place had probably been inhabited by campers before us. One thing that creeped me out a bit was Northern Pike's head hanging on a tree by a fireplace. It was huge, and it looked down on the camping site with its dead and dried eyes. Anyways, the real thing happened after dark. We had been sitting around the campfire for hours, eating, drinking, and talking shit. This happened in the summer, and summers in Norway are not very dark due to its placement on Earth. But around 1 to 2 a.m., it is quite dark. But still, I noticed something on the lake. I couldn't make out what it was, and I didn't really care. After a while, we went into our tents and went to sleep. I had some very strange dreams that night. I saw the pike. It was moving its eyes, making sounds. The skies were changing colors. I saw a man on the lake. The water evaporated and precipitated down again. The pike said something and laughed. Suddenly, I woke up. I was sweating. I looked around. I looked at my phone. It was still nighttime. I was only 14 years old, so my brain wasn't fully developed yet. And underage drinking certainly didn't help. But I was afraid. I had no idea why. It was the kind of fright where you just don't want to see something. I didn't even want to open my tent. I just laid completely still and pretended to be asleep. I heard noises. Noises 
from the dream. Noises that the head on the tree out there had made. I became stiff. I couldn't feel the blood being pumped throughout my body. I heard people shouting. The noises were no more than a hundred meters away. It was more than a hundred meters to land, and the island we stayed on was small. You could probably walk around it in five minutes. The human voices continued. They were shouting and laughing. The laughter is what got to me. It was this kind of ugly laughter. It didn't sound like people were having fun. At some point, it felt like someone was walking towards our campsite. I was scared shitless and just laid completely still. At some point, I must have fell asleep again. I woke up early the next morning. My friend was also up. I asked him if he had heard the noises. He had not. I wondered if it was all a dream. Then I saw something on the lake. A man. He was just standing there on some type of crude raft, about 200 meters away from us. He looked our way. I couldn't make out any facial features. He looked pale. My heart started pounding. The man stood out there for hours. We got so creeped out that we eventually packed our stuff and went home. Luckily, we had a motorboat, so he could never catch up with us. I still remember the way he looked at us as we left the lake and went on to the river. He just stood there. Then it dawned on me. What I saw on the lake in the darkness the night before was probably him. He had been standing there all the time. Was he responsible for the voices I heard? I knew that we weren't alone on that small island, and this wasn't really a place where drunk teenagers went on a spontaneous trip in the middle of the night. Did he place the fish head in that tree to scare people away? Did we step on his sacred ground or something? And maybe, most importantly, why was he standing on a raft out there on the lake? Did he step foot on the island while we were sleeping? Was he planning to do anything to us? And who was he shouting and laughing at? I don't know, and I haven't been back there since. Me and my friend both still get a little creeped out whenever someone mentions the raft man. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true creepy encounters. Before I continue, I would like to give a very special shout out to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elliott, Sugar Spite, Tina Mead, Samantha Play, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Amy Glimco, Anita B, Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Luz Crispin, Patty's Niece, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all for being the pillar that holds Back to Ashes up. And to the rest of the subscribers and listeners, thank you so much for your support. For without all of you all, I would not have a voice. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please stay safe out there and take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.